Welcome to Daniel's Inferno. My name is Daniel. Thank you for joining me today. If you have a moment, please like, subscribe, share, and join the conversation below. I'd love to hear from you. I hope we're all keeping safe. I hope we're all practicing smart social distancing. Today we're going to talk about the state of the Conservative Party in Canada, both provincially in my province of Ontario and federally. So Peter McKay is uh, running to become the leader of the Conservative Party after Andrew Scheer failed in the 2019 elections. Peter McKay is an interesting person to say the least. He is actually one of the people who helped found the current Conservative Party as it is. So he has a large reputation and he's been around for quite some time. He has made a series of blunders, and I think this one was a little a little more harmless than other ones that he's made. Not that other ones that he's made have necessarily been harmful, but I think this one is a little less stupid, I suppose, than other ones that he has made. So he told people today in an email to overcome diversity. He found himself in hot water again after saying that Canadians must overcome diversity, by which he presumably, presumably meant adversity. In an email sent out to his supporters, McKay addressed the ongoing pandemic, saying rather ominously that Canadians have overcome diversity before, we will do so again, a Freudian slip perhaps. Within minutes, this started commenters and political advocates ex expressing their confusion on social media. The distinguished Washington Post writer, J.J. McCullough, for instance, said, geez Louise, when will it end? Referring to other McKay mishaps that have occurred in recent weeks. Yami Yavani, on the other hand, struck a more serious tone, saying his comment was indicative of how carelessly politicians talk about diversity. A more resilient Canada, as you can see, was the title of his email. So McKay's social media campaign has taken a rather odd form over recent weeks. During his ill-advised campaign to speed up the conservative leadership race, which was probably one of his first mishaps, why during uh, a national and global crisis do we need to focus on the conservative leadership race? That should be the last thing. There is still a conservative HQ and top executives in the conservative party that should be able to communicate with one another and come up with a centralized plan that all of these people can agree on. We don't need a singular leader right now at this point, in my opinion. We have our interim leader. This leadership race will happen eventually. You can let me know if I'm wrong, please, but I think we have more pressing matters to focus on. So McKay tweeted a video of California to the tune of an iPhone ringtone. We cannot wait, we cannot delay the vote. In the early days of his leadership bid, McKay's social media team also took great pleasure in creating epileptic fit inducing videos that bar bared resemblance to the hypno toad from Futurama. Ironically, I will show you guys this. Please, if you are prone to seizures, just look away. It is quite epileptic in nature. You have been warned. Seriously, that reminds me of the Hypnotoad. Personally, at least, that's, that's what I saw. We may have all fallen into a trap here. If the goal of McKay's online campaign was to keep Canadians glued to his Twitter feed, then it certainly has been successful. Only time will tell how useful this method is when it comes to the polls. I agree with that. Now, people on Twitter are, of course... They are making fun of him, which I think is not ill-advised because it was quite silly. But there are people who are trying to argue that this, like, 
he did mean diversity. You know, this was a Freudian slip. You, you know, he meant to put adversity, but because he's really against diversity, that's why he put that. Give me one sec. Sorry, guys. In such uncertain times, it's comforting to know Peter McKay's comms will still hardcore suck. I agree with that. Whenever Peter McKay is trending, you can always count on the reason why to be result of mindlessness. Well, that's a good point. You failed at the internet, Peter McKay. Get off. Save yourself. <laughs> that's so true. Honestly, like, go on Reddit and hire some people who will do a better job for you. This is really sad. Didn't Peter McKay go to private school? Money not well spent. Oh, Lord. Peter McKay overcoming diversity. Well done, Pete. This is the Peter McKay campaign right now. Seriously, he's just immolating himself. You heard it, you heard it here. Peter McKay hates diversity. To meet Peter McKay, huh? I know it would be an F up. Perhaps we can get the same people who did the speak well, ditty to craft one of Peter McKay and how we have all overcome diversity. I didn't say the word because I actually believe that word is banned. Uh, it's just a, people don't like that word. Peter McKay is like if a sentient prostate cancer grew arms and legs and got involved in politics. <laughs> Uh, good to see Peter McKay isn't using dog whistles. Yes, Peter McKay, a true leader for all Alberta. A very Peter McKay email. Theory, Peter McKay is intentionally trying to lose the leadership race. He's not this dumb. See, I agree with that. He, Peter McKay is not a stupid individual. He has never been known as a stupid individual. And yet he is making all of these decisions and he's doing these things that are so stupid did he get himself in over his head does he actually want to be the leader or is this a show i'm not sure i really don't know oh see it's stuff like this that bugs me peter mckay vows to restore canadian whiteness to its full glory it's very clearly that he meant adversity all right that Canadians right now are overcoming this adversity of the epidemic. I think you make fun of him. I think it's funny, and I think it's risible that he keeps making these mistakes and he keeps making these gaffes. But I really don't think there was ill intention behind it. I do not think he, he hates diversity. I do not believe that. I personally don't think that. Again, let me know if you disagree. Please tell me why you disagree. Ironically, during all of this, the approval of our established politicians is skyrocketing through the roof. Prime Minister and Premier's polls soar amid the response to the epidemic. Canadians are giving their political leaders high marks for their handling of the novel epidemic according to an exclusive IPSOS poll conducted for Global News. Nearly three out of four Canadians approve of the PM. An even greater number in most provinces, a combined 84% said they approve of their own premier's handling of the epidemic. As much as we complain about government in this country, the truth is when something like what we're seeing with the epidemic crisis happens, the universal institution of choice for people to turn to help to for help is the government. When government actually deliver what it is that they hope governments are going to be able to deliver, the public responds positively. Not surprisingly, nearly 90% of liberal voters gave Trudeau top marks, but a majority of NDP and bloc supporters also approve of the PM, 71% and 54% respectively. Under half of Conservative Party voters said they approve of the way Trudeau is handling the situation. So let's stop there for a moment and just talk, just for a moment. So I am a conservative by nature. I am a fiscal and social conservative. However, 
I am not adverse to giving the PM his dues when they're there. He was very slow to the party. It took him quite a long time to actually take this whole thing seriously, as I've said in past videos. However, since he actually got to the party, he brought all the girls, he brought all the drinks, you know, he brought the music. He's really pulling out all the stops. The CERB, the, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, has really, like, it was so prompt and timely. And I'm actually extremely impressed by that fact. At a provincial level, the, the poll found most Canadians responding even more favorably to government's response to the crisis. In Quebec, Premier, for, excuse my butchering, Francois Legault earned an eye-popping 96% approval rating. That's insane. Legault has been able to connect with people in an authentic way during the crisis. As a result, Quebecers have really lined up almost unanimously. The poll found 79% of Quebec residents back Trudeau's handling of the crisis. And I'm, so this is where things get interesting, in my opinion. So Doug Ford, my premier, uh, had a very low approval rating. It was in the 30 of percents and prior to this crisis. After, and his response to the crisis, uh, he's had, a, as they say, a remarkable political revival. The poll found 83% of Ontarians approve of Ford's handling of the pandemic. That's a nearly 50% jump in approval in just a few months. And it's credited to Ford's small town appeal. He has a plain way of speaking to Ontarians. He's demonstrated himself as a man of action. When he's seen some things that have been irritating to him, he's acted very promptly on them. Even today, we are seeing pictures of him going to warehouses and picking up masks to take to workers. So people are were, at least at one point, making fun of Ford for going out with an M95 mask to pick up other M95 masks, saying, well, look, here he is basically taking this mask away from healthcare workers. You know, he has a right, if he had one of these masks already or got one when they were still readily available in the first week or so of this crisis, that's not illegal. If he is actually trying to help our support workers on the front line, our nurses, our police officers, firefighters, the army. You know, he's he has a right to protect himself while he goes out to pick up these supplies and actually get involved, which is a lot more than many people are doing. Now, granted, we were asked to stay indoors. Okay, we were asked for social distancing and to only go out when absolutely necessary. Ford has really come around. I know people who absolutely despised him and they are now huge fans of him. Honestly, I can see him attempting to run for PM at some point because of his handling of this crisis. I really think it's given him a lot of credibility in Ontario. And Ontario is probably a third of Canada in one province, close, close, close to that. You know, we got 12 to 14 million people here in Ontario, so it's quite large. Um, and it's ironic because here we have Peter McKay, who's doing almost a reverse Ford, and he was liked originally, and he's going downhill, and I'm not sure. It's ironic. The last thing I want to comment on is I had an argument with someone close to me recently on the CERB and people who should benefit from the CERB. Now, I believe people who lost their job due to this crisis are entitled to this CERB, all right? This person who I'm close with was arguing that people who were unemployed prior to the crisis, who didn't have their shit together, were entitled to this money. Now, I don't believe that I strongly disagree with that point. I think that there are programs available to people who aren't working. You know, there's ODSP for people who need it for disability, and there's Ontario Works, which is uh, our welfare, essentially. 
and these things exist to help people when that help is needed. And the system's not perfect, and it's not a lot of money, but you need to make do until you're able to do for yourself, and that's my belief. This person's belief, who was close to me, was that because the unemployment landscape has changed so drastically, these people were entitled to something. But if that were the case, then shouldn't we just blanket give it to everyone? Isn't that just opening the door for everyone to say that they're entitled? People on Ontario Works saying, oh, well, why is everyone else getting two grand? I'm deserving of it now, too. People on disability. They get about 11.50 a month, and I know because I'm on it. <laughs> and it's you know it would be very unfair for me to just sit there and say, well, I'm deserving of the CERB. That's something that I'm deserving of. No, it's not at all. We should just be lucky. We have programs to help people when they need it. This benefit is just a temporary solution. It is not for everyone. It is for people who were paying into the system and then lost their job and can no longer pay into that system and help themselves. Tell me if you disagree, please. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the video or what I just said about my argument with this person. More of a discussion, not really an argument, but the discussion I had with this person close to me. Um, should we just give everybody, you know, a universal income. I know people who believe that there should be a UBI. I think that's a terrible idea. I think that opens the door for people to stop contributing, which means that eventually you can't give the UBI to anyone because people don't contribute. You know, here we look at Spain and they have opened up the door for everyone. Like they're making it, I believe, they're making it so that everybody can get a UBI. They're just trying to institute a UBI. And I believe it's going to really hurt their economy at a time when their economy was already damaged. Every economy around the world is currently damaged. You know, we're doing damage control. This isn't the time to just freely give to everyone. This is the time for us to tr give to those who need it, who are paying into the system, and we make sure they don't lose their houses, that they have food in their stomachs, once we're over this, we will recover. Thank you all for watching. I'm Daniel Inferno. Have a wonderful day.